family in the far west of Nepal on a gap year. Every morning, my friend and I would collect water from the village tap. We knew it was dangerous to drink the water because it would make us sick, so we always filtered it before drinking. Every evening, we ate with the family. We sat on the floor by an open fire. The meals were cooked by the mother of the family. We called her Dee Dee. We always ate with the family, but we waited until we got back to our rooms to drink our filtered water. But there was one evening I was enjoying a green bean dish when I realised that I had eaten the hottest long green chilli that was burning my mouth so much that despite the risk, I picked up the cup of unfiltered water next to me and I drank the lot. Predictably, I became sick and I spent a week or so in bed with a tummy bug, feeling sorry for myself. But my infection was treated with antibiotics and I made a fairly speedy recovery. However, also during my time in Nepal, Dee Dee, the mother of the family, became sick, but she had typhoid fever. She lay on a mat outside the house with glazed eyes. And I remember thinking to myself that it was ridiculous that in this day and age, people were still getting sick and dying from drinking dirty water. Eventually, Dee Dee received the medicine that she needed and she made a full recovery. But it was that experience that inspired me to go into a career in infectious disease and public health. Since that trip to Nepal, I've been intrigued by microorganisms that cause infections in humans. And my research has tried to answer these questions. How do microbes make us sick? And how can we prevent or cure infection to save lives? For much of human history, infectious disease has been a major existential threat. In the 14th century, the Black Death, caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis, killed up to 200 million people, including around 60% of the entire population of Europe. The doctors at the time wore these creepy-looking masks to try to protect themselves. If we cast our minds back to 2014, I'm sure we can all remember the unfolding horror of the Ebola outbreak in Africa. So what have scientists done throughout history as they struggle to control infectious disease? This isn't a new thing. In the 1700s, smallpox was the devastating illness of the time that killed millions of people, and those who survived were often deformed, blind, and horribly scarred. But there was one group in society that seemed immune to smallpox, and they were the milkmaids, whose unblemished skin was legendary. A British medic at the time, Edward Jenner, had an idea about why this might be. Cows were affected by cowpox, an infection similar to smallpox, but did not cause infection in humans. Edward Jenner's idea was that the milkmaids were exposed to cowpox, and this provided them with some form of immunity to smallpox. So, to test his idea, he took the pus from a cowpox pustule, and he inserted it into the arm of an eight-year-old boy, and then exposed that boy to smallpox. Now, the boy did not become sick. And so, Edward Jenner went on to test his idea in more children, <coughs> including his own 11-month-old son. Now, I'm a microbiologist, and I've worked with some pretty nasty microorganisms that kill people, and I try to develop vaccines against them. And I also have three children including an eight-year-old boy. So, I know what you're thinking, <laughs> but no. These days, we would consider it completely unethical, verging on psychopathic, to expose children to 
untested vaccines and potentially deadly microbes. Yet, the fact remains that through his experiments on children, Edward Jenner developed the first vaccination that eventually brought about the eradication of smallpox and saved countless millions of lives. Now, obviously, these days, it's illegal for scientists to test their theories in unsuspecting children. So how do scientists test their theories and develop new medicines? Well, about 150 years ago, animals began to be used as a substitute model for humans. And this practice continues today. Now, since humans are mammals, mammalian animal models were developed like mice and rabbits, and also sometimes larger mammals too. Now, this use of mammals for testing presents us with a moral dilemma. We don't like to think about the pain and the distress caused to the animals. But for most of us, if our parents or our children or our friends were sick, we would want to treat them with medicine to make them better even if those medicines had been developed using animals. Now, I'm a scientist, and I believe in preventing human suffering and using science to develop new medicines. But I also feel the ethical dilemma of using mammals for testing. And I know scientists who have point-blank refused to do any experiments that involve testing in mammals because they feel so uncomfortable about this. But aside from the ethical issues, there are also other practical reasons why it is difficult for scientists to work with mammals. Working with mammals is really expensive. It costs between 200 to 400 pounds to work with a single mouse because of the animal facility costs where the animals have to be housed. And each experiment uses a lot of mice. Working with mammals is also very time-consuming. It's really slow. The experiments have to be planned out months in advance. The experiments themselves take a long time to carry out. And it takes even longer to get the downstream results. And to make matters even more complicated, it's also UK and EU government policy to reduce the number of mammals used for testing. Every scientist who works with mammals in the UK must hold a home office license, and alternatives need to be used wherever they're available. So how do we solve this complex and tangled issue? Well, my research over the past decade has focused around the development of alternatives so that scientists can use fewer mammals in their research. And what does this change look like? insect larvae, the larvae of the greater wax moth, Galeria melanella. Now, insect larvae can't completely replace the use of mammals in research, because there are still certain tests where mammals must be used. For example, before a new drug can be licensed, there are regulatory models that that drug must be tested in, and those regulatory models are currently mammalian. But at earlier stages in research programs, Insect larvae can be used to dramatically reduce the number of mammals. Insect larvae can be used to understand how microbes cause infection. Insect larvae can be used to discover new drugs such as antibiotics. And insect larvae can even be used to test for the safety of new drugs and chemicals. And the results that we get in insect larvae match the results that we get in mammals. But are we just making insect larvae the new lab rats? Well, ethically, it's not the perfect solution because insect larvae are still animals. But they lack pain receptors, which means they don't feel pain and distress in the way that mammals do. And in projects where insect larvae have been used, the number of mammals used has been reduced by up to 80%. And aside from ethics, insect larvae are also a practical solution for scientists. They're very 
cheap, they're very quick to use, and the use of insect larvae aligns with government policy to reduce the number of mammals. So we've looked at this issue from an ethical perspective, and we've looked at this issue from the scientist's practical, logistical point of view. But what does it mean to you if scientists use insect larvae instead of mammals for their research? Well, let's take the example of antibiotics. We read in the newspapers and we hear in the news about multi-drug resistant superbugs that are sweeping through our hospitals, resistant to all known antibiotics. And the World Health Organization has issued a statement that antimicrobial resistance poses a major global public health threat. It is a fact that we are rapidly running out of antibiotics that can be used to control bacterial infection. And we know what life was like before we had antibiotics. An infected wound could result in the amputation of a limb. Before antibiotics, 90% of cases of bacterial meningitis in children resulted in death. Strep throat was often fatal and ear infections could sometimes spread to the brain. Without antibiotics to control infection, commonplace heart, dental, and joint surgery wouldn't be possible. And treatments that suppress the immune system for organ transplant or chemotherapy for cancer wouldn't be viable without effective antibiotics to prevent infection. Insect larvae provide an ethical, rapid, and cheap screen to identify new antibiotics. And because the larvae are so cheap, and they are so quick to use, the experiments can be scaled up so that thousands of potential new antibiotics can be screened for their activity and for their safety with just those compounds with the characteristics we're interested in taken forward for further testing. This opens up opportunities for drug discovery on a scale that is just not feasible in mammals. So, by making the change from mammals to insect larvae, new, life-saving drugs can be developed more quickly, and ultimately that will save lives. For me, as a scientist, it's really exciting that this research can have such a positive impact in society, not just in our local communities, by saving the lives of people with life-threatening infections, but also in countries where dirty drinking water is still a major cause of death and disease over 20 years after my visit to Nepal. Thank you.